So this will be a very short vodcast about properties of metals. And I know it says that this chapter is about ionic compounds, but typically textbooks always slip in a unit about metals because their bonding is similar to, but not identical to that of ionic compounds. So let's start out by doing a simple description. If you were going to describe a pot of gold, the physical and chemical properties of a, either a pot of gold or gold coins, You'd probably start out by saying, hey, they look shiny. Uh, you can pound them out thin and flat. You know that you can stretch things into a wire. Um, you can conduct electricity. So essentially what's happening when you describe the properties of a pot of gold, you're describing the properties of metals in general. So luster means shininess. Um, high melting and boiling point Mm, I don't know if I'd really say they're all high. For example, gallium can melt in your hand, and mercury already exists as a liquid at room temperature. But probably, besides a few exceptions, I would say they have a relatively high melting point and boiling point for some of them, tungsten being the highest of all. Malleability is a fancy word for saying that you can pound it into a thin foil, sometimes as thin as 20 atoms thick. Ductile is the chemical term for being able to stretch metal atoms into a wire. Most of the metals are solids at room temperature, as I mentioned, except for mercury. And the word conductive implies that it can conduct not only heat, but also electricity. And these properties are due to a very unique thing called the metallic bond. And we have a model that we're going to use to explain that called the electron C model. So if you are into section 8.5 in your chapter, you'll probably be able to see pictures showing that metals form a lattice with 8 to 12 other metal atoms surrounding each particular atom. Now they're just atoms in the case of gold, for example, gold. It's not like a crystalline lattice of ionic compound salt with sodium and chloride ions. They'll just be atoms of that particular element. And as you know, Metals have at least one valence electron. In this particular case, they're not forming ions or sharing their electrons. They can do that when you do ionic bonding, and in some cases, I suppose, covalent bonding. But what it looks like is better displayed by using this picture that we'll be seeing on the next slide. They're very crowded with electrons, and what can happen is that the outer energy levels of these metal atoms can overlap. Now here's where the picture worth a thousand words pays off. What you can see here is called the electron C model. And essentially, atoms play fast and loose with their electrons. They kind of just like aren't hanging on real tight to those valence electrons. Yet the centers of a metal were going to stay put. And that would be these, the center cations or the nucleus. But the outermost electrons are free to roam, and you can kind of think of the center of the atoms that are staying put as like little islands, a wash in a sea of electrons. Now, I like to call this the Doherty hippie commune analogy for the metallic bond. Essentially, you can think back to the 60s, people on communes, all this free love. Nine months later, a whole batch of babies show up, and nobody's really entirely certain who's the daddy of all those babies. So what I like to say then is that these electrons don't actually know what was the original atom that they came from. It's just a sea of freely flowing electrons. Now what causes all these positive centers to stay together with each other is kind of interesting. The attraction occurs between the negative electrons holding in and attracting to these positive centers. So what happens, let's take another look at this picture, is that the electrons that are delocalized are free to flow, and they're flowing all throughout this matrix between the atoms. And the attractions are between negative electrons and positive centers. So what happens is that these free flowing electrons convey those properties that we had just talked about in the pot of gold. For example, malleability. When you take a piece of silver and you pound on it, what will happen is that it won't shatter, it deforms. It has enough force to hold it together, but you can apply enough force to be able to push them away. So what will happen is that you can make 
the item get thinner and thinner and thinner, they still hold on to each other because there's still forces of attraction between the positive electrons and, excuse me, the negative electrons and the positive centers. But with enough force, you can shift those layers. So you can change the shape without shattering it. And stretching it into a wire is just another example, except we call that ductility. So the actual bond, which is a little hard to see in a metal, is between the free-flowing or delocalized electrons and the centers or cations or nuclei of the metallic atoms themselves. But what makes this different is that these are all atoms of the same element. These are not ions here that you're looking at. In addition to that, the electrons being able to flow account for the ability to conduct electricity and also to conduct heat, which is why we use metals in cookware. Now rather than clicking on this link and embedding this YouTube video here, there's a short, excellent video that I provided a link for you on the um, Moodle website. So when you go back to the highlighted chapter, chapter 8 about ionic bonding, You'll see the original PowerPoint, you'll see this podcast, and you will see a link to a great video that probably does a little bit better job with the animations explaining the metallic bonding. If you haven't already done so, what you should now be doing is starting that study guide, I think it's section 8.4, but you can check your handout on metals from your textbook. It will be due by the end of the period tomorrow and goes hand in hand with the metals lab that we've started and will finish tomorrow. Okay, that's it, and I'll see you guys at the next time. Adios.